And I've always thought that that was the main point of playing music, is to transport people. I'm too busy looking at the trees to know what the forest is doing. Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater, and I'm coming to you from a such a cool historic location. We're at the Cutting Room in New York City with David Bromberg. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thanks for coming down and sitting down with us. Not at all. I'm glad to do it. I've watched uh, some of your videos, so oh, it's, thank it's you. a pleasure to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, man, I, I uh, looking back in your career, wow. I mean, fantastic going back to the... The folk scene in the uh, in the '60s in the Village, and all the way up to today, putting out albums. Your latest album, uh, Big Road, and, and uh, so much great stuff through the years. And I, I have to ask you first to get started. Lessons with Reverend Gary Davis. Yeah. Is that right? Oh yeah. Um, I was. Uh, that that was 19. I started in 1973, and I only know that date because that was the year that I started college at Columbia. And uh, I was at Columbia for a year and a half. I'm on a leave of absence, actually. Oh, good. Yeah, it's, it's gotten a little long, but... <laughs> so I'm walking along uh, uh, Bleecker Street in, on a Sunday afternoon, I think it was, but the street was pretty much empty. And in front of uh, one of the, the joints, it was called, at that point, it was called the Dragon's Den. They had a sandwich sign which said, Reverend Gary Davis here this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I had to go because I'd, I'd heard a, a record of his, which I loved. Uh, he had one side and Pink Anderson had the other, but it was his side that got me. So I went in and paid my money and watched the show and it was incredible. Um, so afterwards I screwed up my courage and uh, I asked him if he'd give me lessons. Uh -huh. uh, and I expected a negative answer. But he said, sure, $5, bring the money, honey. Uh, that, that was, That's awesome. That was the reverend. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so how long did you take lessons with him? Oh, gee, a few years. Yeah? And what kind of things did he teach you? His songs. Okay. That's what you went to study. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, uh, and his technique, which was close to unique. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Well, since then, you've gone on to be a multi-instrumentalist, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, mandolin, violin, dobro. I mean, just about anything with strings, uh, you're, you're playing it. I, I, I've messed around with a lot of instruments. <laughs> yeah, right. But, you know, after, after a while, if I start practicing on one, my guitars yell at me. Ah, right. Yeah. That's the main thing is the, the guitar yeah. focus. Yeah. Right, right. Nice, nice. So I, I read somewhere that... Uh, well over 100 albums as a guest artist and as a sideman and participating in the albums, but also, of course, your entire solo career, David Romberg and then the David Romberg Band, um, incredibly prolific. Talk a little bit about what drew you into music and what got you started in the whole thing. Boy, that's a good question. Uh, um, my parents had a, a phonograph uh, player, you know, they had a record player, hi-fi. Right. And, and, and a few records, and I found some of those records very moving, and that's what did it. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that that was the main point of playing music, is to transport people. Right, 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 that's fascinating. So how did you get started then? You, were, you took lessons with uh, the Reverend Gary Davis. How did you get started playing your own gigs and work up to your first album? Playing my own gigs, that's kind of an interesting story. Um, the night before I met uh, Steve Berg, uh, I discovered years later, the night before I'd met him, he had been jamming with Jimi Hendrix uh, at uh, Studio 54. Wow. He was a brilliant guitar player. And uh, he'd come over to the house, we'd sit around and, and play for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'd play a tune I knew the words to and I might sing it. And Steve said that I should go out and, and do that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I, I, I couldn't see that. And he said, he said he'd play bass. Now here's a guitar virtuoso ready to stand in the shadow. Wow. So I felt I had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Wow. That had to be an incredible time in New York City with, as, as you say, I mean, Jimi Hendrix was here and there was so much going on in the village and the music scene just had to be so vibrant and so much happening. There was an awful lot happening, yeah. Because 
I mean, aside from the things that at the time I played, um, there was uh, uh, the Broadway shows, there were the jazz clubs, and, uh, there, were, there was classical music, mm -hmm. just beautiful stuff. And uh, um, so in all kinds of genres, there, there was an awful lot going on. Lots happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah and speaking of all kinds of uh, genres, trying to pin down the genre that you sit in is kind of challenging. I mean, there's jazz, there's country, there's rock, there's roots, if you will, there's Americana, there's, I mean, how, how do you classify yourself? How do you think of your music? What I like. <laughs> okay. I, I just never heard anything I liked on the guitar that I didn't want to play. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that sums up why I do what I do. Right. Right. I've, I've heard uh, you refer to it and uh, others as well, that your, your uh, philosophy and approach to music is kitchen sink. What, yeah. does that, what does that mean? Everything but the kitchen sink, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So you, uh, you started playing gigs and you did your first album and uh, Bob Dylan on harmonica. Yeah. How did that happen? I asked him. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, all I, it took. Yeah, I, I had... Uh, been on an album or two of his, mm -hmm. and, and we got along well. And also, I don't know if you know this, you probably do. George Harrison played guitar on that album. I did too. know that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, wow. But I didn't put either of their names on the, on the album. No? No, I wanted their music. I didn't want to stand on their shoulders. Uh-huh. Right, so then later, they, it obviously came out that they had... Uh, Much later. Yeah, they, yeah. They, that they had played on it. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it was just this little album by somebody nobody would ever heard of so so it was quite a bit later that that came out right right even on that first album the early one the range of styles and things that you're covering is very broad on that everything from again more folky kinds of things to uh, more americana and, and uh, just all kinds of different things there were you at that point looking to were you writing a lot and trying to put fit things into genres or were you there were some covers on there as well correct on the, on the first yeah one? i I, uh, I was writing a fair amount at, uh, back then, mm -hmm. uh, but not, you know, not like Dylan used to write, you know, he, his songs just poured out of him, uh, and they didn't pour out of me, but, you know, I could, I could tease one out every now and then. And yes, there were covers because there's plenty of tunes that like the guitar playing, tunes I like, and I, I wanted to make that noise myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like, looking, looking back from the outside, I guess, on those, on those years, that there was a real sense of community among the musicians. You see a lot of musicians playing on each other's albums and appearing on gigs and touring together and things. That had to be very exciting. To be, were you aware at that time of the, the community and the level of, of you know, the people that were with you and that you were at? See, I don't think I was ever aware of much, but I could feel it. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, to put it in words or... Or, or say, you know, oh, there's a sense of community here. I, I wasn't that perceptive or, or uh, whatever the word is for being able to describe things. Yeah, you're just kind of doing it. Yeah. You're, you're doing the gigs and these are the people that you're doing the gigs with. Uh, uh, that's, that's fantastic. In, in hindsight, how does all of that strike you? You know, I should have warned you. I'm really bad at, at hindsight uh, and, and overview. Mm -hmm. it, I'm too busy looking at the trees to know what the forest is doing. Right. Yeah. Which is probably a healthy way to look at it. If you get too, uh, too focused on all that other stuff, then you're missing the music. And, and well, I, I came to that early on when I, uh, I got a, a, a tape recorder and I started taping everything. Mm -hmm. And then one day I realized that I was taping all this wonderful stuff and not listening to any of it. Hmm. That was the end of that. Right? Yeah. Right? It's a little bit analogous to going to a show and doing the video with your phone and, and not watching the show. Yeah. <laughs> Which I really try not to do myself, but it's, yeah. uh, it's always so tempting to try and capture it. But yeah, that's, uh, that's something. So you, you were playing through uh, kind of the 90s, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and now you've, you've been making albums again with the David Bromberg band for quite a while, the newest one is Big Road. Tell us about that album. Well, um, Big Road was a tune that was uh, written by Tommy Johnson. Uh, as far as I know, no relation to Robert Johnson. Uh, Tommy Johnson is best known for a tune that he wrote called uh, Canned Heat. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and the first line of which is, canned heat is killing me, and it killed him. Oh, wow. uh, canned, it, canned heat was sterno, mm -hmm. and uh, back in the day you wanted a cheap high, you'd buy a can of sterno and strain it through cheesecloth and drink it, and evidently it would get you high in addition to blinding you and eventually killing you. A few side effects there that you want to avoid. Oh, a few yeah. side effects, yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Well, that's a sad but, story, yeah. But when we got into the studio to do this, um, on one side of the studio, uh, we were set up like a concert and with a horn section to our, uh, our left. And on the other side of the studio was a video crew. Mm -hmm. And we did five tunes, which they videotaped. Uh, we did each tune twice and picked out the track we liked best. Th those are the tracks that are used on the CD. And if you buy the hard copy, you also get the DVD. Okay. And, uh, and I, I really, I love those tunes. I'm yeah. proud of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, you've, you've had a string of great albums. Uh, the blues, the whole blues, and nothing but the blues also, uh, obviously more blues focused, but uh, still the, the level and, and the interaction among the musicians on these albums is what really catches my ear. And also the thing about that album is that it treated, the blues is, means something different to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these different kind of things called the blues. So we did a, a selection. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but you covered a wide range yeah. of the, the blues style. As yeah. you say, it's very broad. Yeah, yeah. You covered a wide I, range I, of... I, can't, I can't focus my attention, I guess. <laughs> well, it's all good, so why would you? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I'm curious, having worked with so many amazing musicians uh, through the years and played on their albums, they played on your albums, toured with them, what do you look for when you're choosing musicians for your band? Well, I look for a certain level of, of skill, uh, but I've found uh, that that's only a certain level is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, what's more necessary is attitude. If you find somebody who has the basic skills to, to, to do what you're doing with a tremendous attitude to learn, that guy will be the best in the world at the job you give him. Uh -huh. So, Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny when I, when I ask uh, band leaders and musicians that question, I, I almost never get technique or, you know, any of those kinds of things. It's always attitude or easy to get along with, or, uh -huh. you know, all those kinds of things because you have to live with people on the road and, right. and do that whole thing. Right. But with me, it has more to do with um, desire to learn mm -hmm. to play the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you find that uh, players are coming to you now the way you did, Reverend Gary Davis, because you're the elder statesman of so many of these styles? Yeah, that's been happening for a while. Uh, um, I was extremely lucky uh, in that I, I got to, to meet and, and sometimes play with the first generation of blues musicians. Now, Reverend Gary Davis, in spite of his technique, was not a blues singer. And by the way, he was a fantastic singer. He was, people always talk about his guitar playing, but his, his singing was amazing. Hmm. Uh, but I also got to uh, uh, be friends with uh, Mississippi John Hurt, and uh, I did a show with uh, Skip James, several of them with Skip James. Uh, I got to play with B.B. a few times. Wow. You know, I mean, I'm lucky that I met, you know, uh, people who, and, and played with, some of, the, some of the people who, who founded the music. That right, I the like. real deal. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. So I, I would imagine that uh, through all the years with all the instruments you play, that you, do you have a significant guitar collection? Or how do you, how do you look at your guitars? Uh, I just lay my eyes on them. But, uh, <laughs> um, I used to have an extraordinary guitar collection. Uh -huh. um, today, I stopped playing for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I needed some money during those 22 years, I'd sell one of the guitars. So uh, I was talking to Judd Goldrich about this, and uh, I had, uh, at one time, I had Broadcaster number 19 and Stratocaster number 00022. Wow. Uh, I had uh, two pre-war Martin D45s, I had one of two archtop round hole guitars that John, Del John D'Angelico made during his lifetime. Hmm. I mean, I could keep going. It was just a, an extraordinary collection. What I have now is uh, 
things that sound good. I, I mean, I, I've got a couple of electrics that people see as very old. I can't see them that way because of what I used to have, but I, I've got a 59 Tele and a 59 Esquire. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love those, and uh, the Martins I've got are, are, are new, mm -hmm. but they're great. They're just really good instruments, and I, I don't need anything better than what I've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You were a, a, a factor in their whole M series, were you not, with the guitars that you had? Th that's a long story. Um, the, the M series came out of... Uh, a series that they did called the Fs. The Fs were archtop guitars. And as a matter of fact, the F9 was the most expensive guitar that Martin produced, more money than the D45. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I, Matty Umanoff, who has a great guitar store still, um, for a while lived at my apartment. I, I don't remember how long, but it was a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, one time, months after he left, he called me up and he said, uh, I have a guitar here, you have to come down and buy it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I come down and he had a Martin F7, which was not quite uh, as fancy as the F9. It was the next one down. Uh, he said, you buy this and I'll give you a gift. Okay. Uh, it was 400 bucks and I could lay my hands on that. And uh -huh. I bought it and then didn't think about it for over a year. And he called me up and at the time I had uh, a few uh, 42 Martins. In other words, there were Martins with a certain pattern of inlay, uh, abalone inlay. Uh, they, they called those things the 42s or the 45s, but I had 42s. So it, what he gave me he put a new top and a new neck on this guitar and, and abalone so that it was a, a, a 42. And, uh, but of course, Martin never made anything like that. Eventually they did. The, uh, those became the, uh, the M series and it's Matt Umanov who made it. And I fell in love with it because it was, a, just to backtrack a minute, if you're playing in a living room an acoustic guitar, the best one is a, a, a Martin Dreadnought, uh, you know, if you want a steel string. But if you're putting it through a microphone, you've got to take a lot of that bottom out. But um, the M series you, has a different kind of bass. It's, it, it's, it's not like this, it's like this, it's a solid thing. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so for playing in an auditorium, you know, uh, or a, a concert hall or a, a stadium, it's really much better. And for recording, I find it to be, again, much better. You don't have to do as much monkeying with it. So that's the story of the M's. Right, so they, they designed those after a, a original. Oh yeah, uh, they, they sent somebody to, uh, to a place I was playing some cl club uh, not far from Nazareth, uh, where the Martin factory is. And they brought some guitars with them and they said, uh, we're interested in uh, uh, what you think of these. And I said, well, uh, I don't know, you know. So we'll take, take a, a one or two of these and, and then we'll, we'll come back and talk to you. And these were uh, as thick as a dreadnought. So they gave you everything that I didn't want. So when they came back, I said, you know, they're very nice guitars, but I, I, I would never use one. And their faces fell. And, and then they said, we weren't going to tell you, but people have been asking us for a guitar like you play. I said, why don't you make one like I play? And they said, well, because they have no bass. I said, what? Well, they have no bass. Our, all our executives have told us that. I said, wait a minute, I got my guitar in. I say, now play this and tell me it has no bass. Holy cow! It has a beautiful, a beautiful bass. Okay, let us borrow one of your guitars. Right. So I loaned them one and they copied it. And, that, and that's the story of the M series. That's, that's how that started. That's awesome. Yeah. So the other guitar I wanted to ask you about was the Telemutt. Uh huh. 
that's a, tell, well, tell us the story. Of Which that. telly? It, a, a, the story I, I heard is it's a, got a different neck on it. And it's a vintage. Oh, neck. yeah, yeah, the 59. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it has a 58 neck. Uh-huh. Yeah. So how did you come across the parts and end up putting them together? Well, ooh, good question. Okay, I ran into the guitar already put together like that. Okay. Except that the uh, neck pickup was uh, uh, a modern thing. But it sounded great. Mm -hmm. and, and the guitar sounded wonderful. It was a, a 59 body with a 58 neck. Uh, I'd love to find a, a 59 neck and make it all of a piece, but... You know, it was how I got it. And I was able to find a pickup of, of the right, uh, from the right period for the neck pickup, and that it also sounds great. Mm. So I have that in. So it's, it's a little bit more of a complete thing now. And, uh, so that's a humbucker that you have in the No, in that's, the neck? that's on my Esquire. Ah, okay. Which I've had since uh, the invention of dirt. <laughs> okay. I, 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 got, I bought that in the 60s, I think. Uh -huh. And, of course, in the 60s, it wasn't a vintage. It was just used. used. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've just always loved it. And uh, that has a, a humbucker, in, uh, a patent applied for, actually, in the, in the neck position. Mm -hmm. And that's a, the other thing that's perhaps a little interesting is the amp that I use. Uh, my wife bought it from me from... Uh, the man who was doing sound for me at the time, it was in his basement. It's an, a 30s mm -hmm. Electar. Electar, there 30s you go. Electar, which was made at the time to be used with a, a lap steel. Mm -hmm. And it's this big by this high. And uh, I, I put it in the overhead when I fly. Oh, wow. And my band, I mean, my... My business manager w became convinced that, th that this was going to fall apart. It was too old. And they built them like iron then. Right. But we went out and bought a pretty good sounding amp, uh, which we still take on the road for a second amp because my band agrees with me. That Electar, that's the sound that, you know, that. Right. That's it. Right. Yeah. Right. So that combination. Yeah. One of the tellies and the lectar, and yeah. that's, that's all you Usually need. Usually the Esquire, because I played that for so many years. Uh-huh, right, yeah. right. So, to me, the way to authentically learn a style is to go back to the original people who were playing it. If someone wants to get into the real roots of Americana and blues and the folk styles and things, what would you point them to to listen to and to learn from? Well, they'd have to be more specific to me. I, I, I mean, you're talking about... Uh, um, 30s Southern black music, 30s Southern white music, 40s mm -hmm. jazz, uh, uh, 50s. I mean, where? What, what are you talking about? So you about? gotta really focus yourself if, and choose if you, the... Yeah, if you're talking 19th century, I have no idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Then we'd be talking classical probably more. Yeah. <laughs> Man, well, it's, it's such a world to explore, and you cover so much of it in all your albums. I highly recommend checking out the entire catalog because you've done so much fantastic stuff in so many different areas. You're very uh, kind. Thank and you're, you. You're, you're doing it. You're out there making albums, and you're touring. You're touring through November, December, and gigs into 2023. We have uh, mostly uh, this month and next month off. We were touring like, like crazy monkeys uh, for, uh, for the last few months. Mm-hmm. And so we got a couple of months off, and then we go back to it around January. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, best of luck with that. The new album's fantastic. Big Road. Recommend everyone pick that up. And thanks again for sitting down with us. And, oh, uh, no, thank sharing you. Sharing everything. It's such an amazing career, and it's been a real pleasure to meet you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank Great to you. see you. Good to see you. And thank you for joining us at the Cutting Room Club here in New York City. David Bromberg, and I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.